Well, I want to take the time to thank you for listening to this talk. My name is Brett, Brett Hauer. I'm a member of Grace Christian Fellowship, a small church here in Spokane, Washington. And I'm not a pastor, but I recently heard a sermon by one of my pastors, Pastor Bill Farley. He's written several books uh, under the pen name William P. Farley. And in that sermon, he brought up the passage of Scripture, 2 Samuel 12. And kind of as a side note, he talked a little bit about how Jesus was a fulfillment of that passage. And it was really encouraging to see another specific example of God fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy in the New Testament. Now, it's important to note that the Bible doesn't explicitly say that the prophecy in 2 Samuel was about Jesus. Therefore, we would call this a typological fulfillment. So since that was kind of a side note in Bill's sermon, I looked online and tried to find uh, a more in-depth sermon on this passage, and I couldn't find one. So the talk that you're about to hear is a result of me doing a little bit of research and writing down a talk um, about 2 Samuel chapter 12 and how the Nathan's prophecy is ultimately fulfilled by Jesus. Now this talk, the way I wrote it, is um, a bit more for younger Christians or people who aren't Christians and don't know about Christianity, so it's more of an evangelistic talk, and eventually I would like to write a more in-depth technical talk um, for people who have been Christians a while and they know the basics already. But thank you for taking the time to listen to this, and I hope you are encouraged by it. I've entitled this talk, The Sons of David. And if you'd like to remember the key theme of this talk, remembering this title might help. Note that I said the sons, not just one son, but plural. The sons of David. Why this is important will hopefully become evident as we study God's word together. If you have with you a copy of God's word, please open it to 2 Samuel chapter 12. And follow along as I read verses 9 through 14. Second Samuel is about one quarter of the way through the Bible, and it comes right after the books of Ruth and First Samuel, go figure, but before First Kings. If you don't have a Bible with you, it's okay. Just listen as I read. Now keep in mind that this is the prophet Nathan speaking to King David. 2 Samuel 12, 9 Why have you despised the word of the Lord, to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you once again for your holy scriptures, which are able to make us wise unto salvation through faith, in your Son, Jesus. We pray that you would use your word, even right now, to save those who might be listening who do not yet know you. We 
pray also that by the Holy Spirit, you would open the eyes of the hearts of believers who might be listening. That we would know together what is the hope to which you have called us. What are the riches of your glorious inheritance in the saints? Thank you, Father, for graciously forgiving me, a helpless wretch. And I pray that the words I speak would glorify you. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Well, in this passage of sacred scripture, we see that King David was in big trouble. He had arranged for a man named Uriah to be killed, and he took Uriah's wife for himself. Look with me at verse 9. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and have taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now this verse is actually a condensed description of what was recorded just one chapter earlier in 2 Samuel chapter 11. You may have heard the story, David is walking on the rooftop of his palace, and he looks down and spots a very beautiful woman taking a bath. So he inquires about her, and he finds out her name is Bathsheba, and that she's married to Uriah. Now, King David knows that God's law forbids coveting or desiring your neighbor's wife, Deuteronomy 5.21. But he ignores, or as our passage in 2 Samuel 12.9 says, despises the word of the Lord and covets anyway, thus doing evil in God's sight. But David's evil doesn't stop there. He sins for Bathsheba and then he sleeps with her, thus breaking the seventh commandment from Deuteronomy 5.18, you shall not commit adultery. And as if all this sin was not grievous enough, David arranges for Bathsheba's husband Uriah to be put at the very front of a battle line and orders everyone else to draw back so that Uriah is killed. Now, there are major consequences for David's sin. Look with me at Nathan's prophecy in verse 10. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This prophecy has been proven correct throughout the entire history of Israel. Even three of David's sons died by the sword. And what about verse 11? Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes, and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. This prophecy is fulfilled by David's son Absalom in Second Samuel 16.22 where Absalom sleeps with some of David's wives outside in front of view of all Israel. At this point, you could be asking, how does this apply to me and my life? Well, you see, you and I have broken God's laws. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. David's is only one of many, many examples in the Bible of sin leading to suffering. Sin might bring fleeting pleasure, but it always brings lasting pain. You can be sure that there are earthly consequences for our sin against God. Well, at this point in our passage, David repents. Verse 13. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And this was genuine repentance. You can even read David's account of turning from his sin and to God for mercy in Psalm 51. But notice the rest of verse 13, where Nathan says, The Lord also has put away your sin. 
you shall not die. You see, in Israel, God had set the punishment for murder and adultery as death. If it were not for God showing mercy, David would have received the death penalty. But instead of David dying, it is prophesied that his child would die. Look with me at verse 14. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. The Hebrew word translated as child here is habben. I'm not sure how to pronounce that exactly, but habben will work for now. And it could also be translated as son. So not just child, but it could also be son. The son who is born to you shall die. Well, just as was spoken by the prophet, 2 Samuel 12 records the death of Bathsheba's and David's young son. You may be thinking, wow, that's really sad. So the moral of the story is don't sin or else there will be horrible consequences. Well, that is only part of the story. King David and the prophet Nathan lived nearly 3,000 years ago. But Nathan's prophecy was ultimately fulfilled, in one sense, nearly 1,000 years later. 1,000 years after this part of the Bible, 2 Samuel, was written. And it's a fulfillment that is incredibly good news for David and for all Christians. You see, all throughout the Old Testament, there are promises of a Messiah who would come from the line of David prophecies of a suffering Savior and King. Jesus is the fulfillment of all those prophecies and promises. And it's possible that he was being referred to when Nathan prophesied, The son who is born to you shall die. Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the very first verse of the New Testament, starts with these words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ the son of David. Jesus is a descendant of David and heir to his throne. This is why he is called David's son. In the book of Matthew alone, Jesus is referred to as the son of David 17 times. So Nathan foretold that God would put away David's sin and that his son would die in his place. And this was fulfilled by an imminent event. But that event points us to an event which would take place 1,000 years later when Jesus died on the cross. In other words, the prophecy was fulfilled when David's immediate son died as a consequence for David's sin. But we see a striking similarity to this event when Jesus, David's later son, died as the atonement for David's sin. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And let's break that down. The wages of sin is death. David deserved the death penalty because of his sins. But the free gift of God is eternal life. God graciously allowed David to live. In Christ Jesus our Lord, David's son died in his place. Jesus the true and better son of David, never sinned. Therefore, when he takes someone's place, his perfect sinless record becomes theirs. Jesus is also fully God and fully man, fully the son of God and fully the son of David. Therefore, his death was infinitely valuable to pay the penalty for all of David's sins, all of my sins, and for the sins of all those who place their hope and trust in him. And finally, Jesus rose from the dead. Thus we have the blessed assurance of eternal life. John 3.36 tells us that whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So what does all this mean to us? Well, if you have not repented and placed all your hope and trust in Jesus, 
The Bible says you are headed for eternity in hell. That's what happens after you die in this life. You get eternity in hell. If that's you, we love you, and that's why I'm pleading with you to repent and trust in the Son of David. He's the only one who can save us from our sins. If you are a Christian, marvel in the fact that God has saved you from your sins. He loves you so much that he sent his Son to take the punishment that you deserve. Indeed, God put away your sin by placing it on Jesus, and Jesus has fully paid the penalty that your sin deserves. The reward is eternal, unspeakable joy in heaven after we die, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Christian, struggle against sin. But when you fail, turn away from your sin and to Christ. And remember, we are saved not by our works, but by Jesus' perfection. If you are tempted to give in to sin, remember the many warnings in Scripture. Like David's sin, all sin leads to sorrow. The Bible says in Galatians 6, verses 7-10, through 10, that we will reap what we sow. Even though as Christians we are saved by God's grace from eternal damnation, our sin still has earthly consequences. If you are someone who is continuing to live in repeated willing sin without repentance, you are not a Christian. Hebrews 10.26 warns that Jesus will not forgive those who deliberately keep on sinning without repentance. I'm not saying that Christians never sin, but I am saying that the Holy Spirit is at work in Christians and so Christians will be marked by increasing holiness. And finally, if your past sins have caught up to you and seem to be wreaking havoc in your life, remember God's promise from Romans 8.28 that for those who love God, all things work together for good. David reaped some terrible consequences for his sin, but God worked it for good. You see, after David and Bathsheba's first son died, they had another son, and this son had a son, and this son had a son, and so on, until ultimately, Jesus was born of a descendant virgin girl named Mary. So God took a marriage that started with grievous sin and agonizing consequences, and he worked it to bring about the birth of the Savior, the perfect son of David, the son of God, who died for the sins of the whole world, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your inspired, inerrant word. Thank you for the amazing continuity that the Old Testament has with the New Testament. And Lord Jesus, I thank you for this reminder from Second Samuel that Moses and the prophets in the Old Testament we're testifying of you. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would use the talk I just gave to help us remember and believe the scriptures. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.